Now then, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Linda Geddes to you. Uh, Linda is a reporter for New Scientist. She's an award-winning writer covering the science of sex, death, and everything in between. She graduated from the University of Liverpool with a first class degree in cell biology, and earlier this year published her first book, Bumpology, the myth-busting pregnancy book for curious parents-to-be. So here's Linda, who's going to talk to us about anaesthetics and consciousness. Hello. Um, what does nothing feel like? It's difficult to imagine, isn't it? Because even if you still your brain and try to drown out the sounds of the person sitting next to you, they're coughing, they're shuffling, you might start to become aware of the sounds in your own head, the sound of your blood beating, um, the sound of your own breath, and maybe the fact that one of your buttocks has started to go, go numb. It's really difficult to clear your brain of everything. Sleep is one time when we kind of perhaps edge a little bit closer to nothingness. But then, of course, we dream and we can be woken up from sleep. Uh, and, um, drugs and alcohol are another uh, way to kind of get ourselves a little bit closer to nothingness. Um, but of course, even though you may lose some of your memories um, and not remember what you said to your boss in a fit of drunkenness, um, <laughs> it's not really nothingness, it's more of an altered state of consciousness. What about death? Well, yes, death is probably about as close to nothing as we can come, but most of us don't have the privilege of dying and then coming back to analyse what that felt like. But actually, hundreds of thousands of people every day are clo taken pretty close to oblivion and live to tell the tale. If you've ever been in the hospital for an operation, then you will have experienced it yourself. I'm talking about general anaesthesia. This is where I realised that I don't know how to work the slides. So, <laughs> anaesthesia. If you haven't experienced it, let me enlighten you about this profoundly weird experience. You'll walk into an operating theatre, usually clutching your belongings in a kind of drafty, drafty gown, and you'll be told to lie down on the bed and put your bag under the table. Then the anaesthetist will distract you with some funny tale or ask you to imagine that you're going into a bar and having a drink. All the while, they're kind of deftly sliding a needle into your hand. They'll keep talking to you and they'll try and keep you talking. And suddenly you'll realise that your hand has gone cold. As you're talking, you might become aware of the fact that you're sounding a little bit like you're drunk. And then, bang, you wake up in another room with a clock on the wall telling you that 40 minutes of your life has just passed and you remember nothing about it at all. And actually, in that 40 minutes, someone has rolled you over, cut you open, rummaged about inside you, then stitched you back up again, possibly moved you onto another trolley, and put you in another room. And you have no memory of it, hopefully, at least, if the anaesthetics have worked. <laughs> but perhaps the most remarkable thing about anaesthetics is that no one really understands how they work. The first operation um, under general, general anaesthetic occurred about 170 years ago um, in Massachusetts General Hospital in, um, in the US. And it involved holding ether next to a patient's face and they inhaled it and then they fell unconscious. A year later, chloroform was used. And, um, and that was, I think that was in Edinburgh. It was more effective, but it had nasty side effects like killing people <laughs> occasionally and also um, causing severe liver damage. And over the years, more and more different types of substance that can cause you to lose consciousness have, um, have, have turned up. But there's a mystery in this. Most drugs are quite simple to understand. Um, you have a receptor on a cell somewhere in your body. It's usually a protein. Um, a molecule will bind to it and cause that protein to change its structure, and that changes the effect of the protein. And a lot of drugs work by either mimicking a naturally occurring molecule or binding and blocking that, um, that receptor. But if we look at the structures of some anaesthetics, you realise there's a bit of a problem. So there's pro propofol, which is a fairly complex um, molecule. This is the thing that most, um, this is how anaesthesia is usually induced. It's what they put in your hands to kind of start the whole process off. So it's injected, it's fairly complex, 
Then you've got sodium thiopental, which was the kind of thing that used to be used before propofol, and it's still used uh, on death row before, before you administer the chemicals that kill you. It's what they use to knock you out. This is a barbiturate. It's even more complicated structure. Chloroform. This one's different because it's inhaled, and it's a lot simpler. Then you've got xenon, which isn't even a molecule, it's an atom. And again, it's inhaled, and it triggers unconsciousness. So it's, it's kind of a mystery. How can it be that all these really different molecules can have the same effect? It seems unlikely that some of them, which are large and complex, are fitting the same lock as a tiny thing like xenon. One idea um, was that, uh, one, of the, one of the early ideas was that they all seem to dissolve in olive oil. So, you know, these are the anaesthetists back in the 1850s. They noticed that these things all seem to dissolve in olive oil, which led to this idea that possibly they were um, doing something to the fatty portion of the brain, so that some of the, bit, some of the brain is quite fatty and oily. Maybe they were dissolving in this bit of the brain and taking something away from the brain and causing it to knock itself out. As our kind of understanding and knowledge of how cells and neurons work developed, um, this kind of lipid hypothesis developed, and still people were thinking maybe they're getting into the lipid bilayer of cell membranes and they're doing something, they're distorting it somehow so that the neurons can't fire properly. And then in the 1980s and 90s, people discovered that actually these things do bind to proteins. Um, some of them, at least, bind to ion channels, which are the the means by which um, nerve cells conduct electrical impulses. And they don't seem to be doing what conventional drugs do, so they don't seem to be changing the structure of these ion channels and opening or closing them, but they seem to be distorting them in some way. And actually, it's still a bit of a mystery. We still don't really understand how it can be that all these things affect nerve cell firing, but, but they do somehow. Um, but molecular mechanisms aside, there is perhaps a more interesting way of thinking about how anaesthetics cause unconsciousness. And that is to think at the whole brain level. So what, what are these things doing to the brain? And um, how does that differ from normal consciousness? Me talking to you now, what's happening in my brain? And how does that differ from when I'm un unconscious? It's a difficult question to answer because if someone looks unconscious, they can't really tell you whether they really are unconscious or not. And actually, the tools that anaesthetists have for monitoring depth of consciousness are pretty crude. So typically, they'll first of all, one of the first signs that someone's unconscious is they stop talking. And then as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you start stabbing them with <laughs> blades and seeing if they wake up. <laughs> it's surprisingly crude. Um, but it's a similar dilemma facing doctors who look after coma patients. Are these patients really conscious? In 2009, Newspapers around the world carried this story about Rom Huben, who was a Belgian man who um, was involved in a traffic accident in about 1983, and he fell into a coma. And um, everyone had assumed that he was in a coma. And then, I think it was around 2006, um, he allegedly learned to communicate through a therapist who held on to his paralyzed arm and hand and said that she could feel him guiding her towards the keys on a keyboard. And Rom Huben began to speak. He began to talk from his coma about how awful it was to be paralysed and to be locked in, and, but to be having these profound thoughts the whole time. At one point, he was said to be writing a book about his experiences. But in 2010, a more rigorous test was done. And the, the therapist was sent out of the room and... The doctors showed Rom a series of pictures and said things to him. Then they brought the therapist back into the room and they asked him to describe what had happened during that time. And he couldn't do it. So that kind of, that sort of threw a spanner in the works for the idea that Rom was actually conscious. And then, um, and then his family got a bit fed up and <laughs> said, we don't want to do any more tests on him. So we still don't really know whether he's conscious or not, but the kind of current feeling is that probably not. But anaesthetic, anaesthetics are useful in this regard because actually by starting to unpick what they're doing, 
to the brain when we fall unconscious. Scientists are starting to make some inroads into understanding consciousness during coma or other altered states of consciousness. So all of this work is quite recent, but one of the early observations was that as you, as you begin to fall unconscious, it's a bit like if you imagine a house with all the lights on. Bit by bit, the lights seem to switch off. So one of the first things to go is the basal ganglia, which is what regulates movement. And then later, there seems to be this disconnection of the thalamus, which is like the brain's central switchboard. So it takes signals and directs them to other parts of the brain and shares information. Um, but actually, so that was, that was, people started to think maybe there's this single seat of consciousness and when that button, when that light goes off, that's it. But actually more recent su studies, um, both in anaesthesia and in coma patients, are suggesting that consciousness isn't necessarily such an on-off thing, it's more gradual. So one of the, one of the most interesting uh, studies was published just a couple of weeks ago by some researchers at the University of Oxford. And they were using, again, they were using propofol, which is the standard drug that's used to knock people out in surgery. But rather than just, you know, getting a needle and squirting it in, and usually that makes you lose consciousness in, I don't know, five to 15 seconds, they were doing it much, much more gradually. So they were slowing the whole process of making someone anaesthetized over 45 minutes. And, um, and it produced some interesting results. So what it showed was that Actually, the, the um, progression into unconsciousness is, is on a slow sliding scale. So you start off feeling a bit lightheaded, which is kind of equivalent to being drunk. Then you get to a point where you won't, you won't remember stuff. And then you, you fall unconscious. And this is kind of, this is akin to sleep. So you start picking up these, um, these slow wave oscillations in the brain, which is where these brain cells are switching between a kind of active and inactive state. No one really knows what slow wave oscillations are there for and why we produce them, but the overall effect is that you, you fall deeper and deeper into unconsciousness. And as that happens, the ability of the brain to communicate globally, so different parts of the brain to speak to each other, becomes less and less. And as more and more brain cells fall into this slow oscillation pattern, um, eventually this plateau gets reached. And actually at that point, that seems to be the point at which there's no more long distance communication between the different areas of the brain. It doesn't mean the brain is unresponsive. So if you prick someone with a scalpel or you shine a light in their eyes, um, the areas of the brain that will respond to those signals, the kind of immediate sensory areas of the brain will light up and the thalamus will as well, which is the switchboard area. But it's not doing its normal job of routing that message to the other areas of the brain that would normally make sense of what's happening. So it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like a message is reaching a mailbox, but no one's actually picking it up. And all of this suggests that rather than there being a single seat of consciousness in the brain, it's possibly a more diffuse phenomenon. Consciousness is the result of lots of different brain areas talking to each other, not a single thing. And coma researchers are finding something similar in their patients. So in the past, people used to be quite seduced by the idea that if you talk to someone in a coma, um, you, get, you get lighting up in the area of the brain that responds to sound. And they thought, well, maybe this means that they can understand what, what we're saying. But it looks like there's this similar breakdown in global communication in the brain. So again, the message is hitting the mailbox, but no one's there to pick it up. But actually, these kind of studies, the study I've just talked about from Oxford, do have practical uses, because not all coma patients are equal. And it's thought that up to about 40% of patients who are in a vegetative state, you know, a coma, um, actually may be in a kind of slightly higher state of consciousness, where maybe they, they can respond sometimes. But it's just not being picked up. So a few years ago, a researcher called Adrian Owens, who used to be, I think he used to be at Cambridge, but he's been poached by the Canadians now. Um, he took a 26-year-old woman who'd been in a vegetative state for five months, after, again, after a traffic accident, and he asked her to imagine two things while scanning her brain. First of all, he asked her to imagine playing a game of tennis. <laughs> 
And then he asked her to imagine walking through the rooms of the house. Now, if you did this in a healthy person, you'd expect to see um, activity both in those areas of the brain that just respond to sound and talking. But also, in the case of tennis, you'd expect to see some activity in the motor areas, the areas that are involved in controlling movement. And in the case of imagining someone to walk through a room in a house, you expect to see some activity in the area involved in recalling, recalling um, visual scenes. If you do this in an anaesthetised patient, you wouldn't expect to see this kind of spreading of activity. And when he did it with this, this coma patient, her brain looked just like a normal person's, suggesting that maybe she was actually perceiving and thinking about these things, even though she looked like she was, you know, she looked like there was nothing there. He went on and did this in more patients, and certainly not all of them could do this, and it seemed to be a minority <coughs> of coma patients who were... Thank you. <laughs> it seems to be a minority of coma patients, but some of them could do it. And even more remarkably, he's now using this away, as a way of actually communicating with people who are in this kind of locked-in state. So if you imagine, well, it means you can ask basic yes or no questions. So if you, you know, yes is, if you think yes to this answer, I want you to think of playing tennis. If the answer's no, think of walking around a house. And so there's a way of actually communicating with these people who, until recently, we thought were, were gone. And I suppose what all of this is telling us is that consciousness really is less like a light switch and more akin to a dimmer switch. And these studies using anaesthesia could also be useful in terms of reducing cases of interoperative awareness or giving people too much anaesthetic because it's actually providing a tailored means of telling when someone really is under and when they're not. Now, research, I think researching and writing all of this has just given me a new respect for the humble hospital gas man. Because it really is taking people as close to the brink of nothingness as it's possible to go without dying. And every year, anaesthetists guide millions upon millions of people to this place, and then still without really understanding how they do it and not really being able to monitor them particularly well, they bring them safely back again.